Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, sorry I wasn't here last week. I know those of you who are watching this asynchronously won't have noticed, but I had to cancel last week. I've been... There, there has been uh, much illness in my house over the last couple weeks, uh, so I, I was... Uh, fighting my way through something last time, but I'm better this week, and uh, glad to be back with you guys to begin, finally, after an unexpected delay, the Council of Elrond, uh, which is good. So I think we'll get a pretty good chunk of the way through it before the end of the year. Of course, we only have two sessions left because we've got next week, and then the two Tuesdays after that are Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, respectively, and I'm pretty sure I've got family things I have to do uh, on those days. In fact, I know for a fact. So, um, so we're not, I'm not going to be able to do class those days. So next week will be our last one for the year. Uh, so, you know, I'm pretty confident we'll get, uh, we'll get pretty far into things here uh, uh, in uh, these next two weeks. So, anyhow, um, let me, before uh, we start, just a couple announcements, uh, things that I wanted to mention. First of all, the day after tomorrow, on Tuesday, the 12th of December, we have uh, a, uh, a special symposium um, called um, What is Signum Culture? Uh, it's going to be hosted by Bretton Dickinson, one of our faculty members and the, uh, uh, the, the, the host of the of a, a wonderful uh, 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 blog uh, on Narnia and C.S. Lewis. Um, so anyway, I, I would recommend that. It's a, a really fun discussion, going to be uh, Signum students and staff and, uh, and faculty just kind of talking about what makes Signum different. Signum is, uh, a, a, you know, of course, in many ways, such an interesting experiment. And uh, we are you know, have been working to, to build an online community and, uh, uh, you know, both within our institution, you know, as far as the, the, uh, the relationship of our, our staff members with each other and our faculty and staff and our whole team together. Um, and then, um, uh, and of course our student community and our, our larger, uh, community and everything. So, um, it's, going to be, and I'm, I'm going to talk for a little bit, but only for a tiny little bit. So this is not going to be like me talking about what I, uh, or not just me talking about what I wish Signum culture to be, but this is really something initiated by other folks, uh, at Signum who wanted to kind of talk and share about it. So I think that's, um, going to be really cool. So that's going to be Thursday, uh, the 12th at 2 PM Eastern time. Uh, and you can go, the uh, Druid's Fire just posted the link in Discord and in the Twitch chat I see. Uh, just go to signumuniversity.org uh, uh, slash event, and you can see uh, the link to that, so you can register for that. We'll also broadcast that on Twitch as well. Um, so the, that's one announcement. Second thing is we are doing a special, we're doing a, 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 a special on gift certificates. So if you wanted to get a, a gift certificate for an anytime audit registration, if you would like to give the gift of uh, a, a Signum course, the content of one of our Signum courses uh, to someone that you know, who you think would really enjoy one of our courses, you know, somebody who would like to learn Old Norse, somebody who would like to, you know, get one of our uh, discussions, you know, like maybe Amy Sturgis's, uh, you know, uh, science fiction survey, maybe, uh, you know, one of my Tolkien's poetry class, who knows, there are all kinds of classes you can go through and pick any course, almost any course, uh, any course that has lecture material um, in the Signum catalog. And uh, you can give that uh, as a gift. So what you do is you give a gift certificate and then the person who receives the gift certificate can choose any one that they want. Um, so and it is also true. You can get the gift certificate and then use it yourself if you want to do that as well. There's uh, no rule against uh, self gifting uh, gift certificates. Uh, that'll be pretty cool. So uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's definitely that's another thing that's going on that'll that'll run through Christmas time. Uh, so uh, uh, definitely act on that now. Uh, it's an excellent last minute Christmas gift. And then finally, I wanted to remind you of I know I've mentioned this before, but uh, Kay Ben Abraham is uh, has begun uh, posting uh, episodes, the first couple chapters are up now uh, for her novel, The Flower of the Cedar, which uh, 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 Signum is uh, helping to, uh, to host and promote uh, big fan of Kay and of her writing and of her work, her reading is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the audiobook, the serial audiobook that she is releasing through her podcast feed is a real treat. So I just 
just invite you to take part in that. Obviously, there's no uh, charge for that. You can just look for it again. It's called The Flower of the Cedar is the name of the podcast. Uh, and um, uh, and I, just, I encourage you to uh, uh, to check that out. The Almoinen has uh, been listening and says it's uh, uh, it's wonderful. Isn't it really good? I think it's it's really excellent. Uh, uh, the first first couple chapters blew me away. I've I've read those before. Um, I got a little preview, but I stopped reading after the first two chapters because I wanted to read them as they came out with everybody else. So um, yeah, she did read a little bit uh, at New England Moot. De La Mancha. She read like the some of the the sort of the prologue material uh, there. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a it's it's a lovely lovely book. And and as I say, her it's, if you like audiobooks, uh, her reading is is gorgeous. I could listen to her read all day. So um, just wanted to. Uh, remind you of that. It is only available as an audiobook right now, Veronica. Um, after the the release is complete, so she's going to read a chat. She's going to release, uh, I think, a chapter a week or so um, uh, during you know over the course of the this next year. Uh, and then when the book uh, has, when all of the book has been released, I think there will be a print run as well for people who would like to have a print copy as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, she decided that she was uh, going to do this sort of experimental alternative route of uh, publishing it as a serial podcast, uh, a serial audio book uh, initially, which I think is really, really fun. Um, so anyway, just wanted to draw your attention to that uh, uh, to that again. Um, at see, Arden Cran is asking, is there Signum merch we can buy to show our support? Yes and no. We don't have an online store right now, though that's something that we're kind of working on. Um, but uh, I do. The primary place to buy Signum merch is actually at our regional moots. At our regional moots, I actually bring along with me uh, a uh, a big suitcase full of Signum merch. Um, I call it my moot case, uh, which I check and bring around the country with me. Uh, so uh, that's one of the best places to get Signum merch. And also, of course, at Myth Moot as well. We have a lot of stuff there. Um, we're going to be working on uh, an online store. That's something that's been on our kind of wish list for a while, but uh, it's kind of working its way up the priority list here. Um, <laughs> so anyway, good question. All right. Um, let me... Um, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. I know it's a really, it's really a, a bad pun, but it's kind of fun. Um, uh, yeah, and actually, you know, the, 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 the funny thing is that, um, I realized last year, you know, at one of the moots that, you know, when I was kind of wheeling around my big old moot case and, uh, I, I, uh, I was realizing that the contents of that suitcase are actually probably about 80% of the, um, like physical assets of Signum University. Like we don't own almost anything. Uh, you know, we, we own almost no material property. Uh, you know, we're like a Franciscan order or something. You know, we have no real estate. We don't own our own servers. We don't do anything like that. Um, but I think like the, you know, the t-shirts and cups and stuff that I carry around in that moot case represents the largest single physical asset of the university. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. Anyway, um, uh, so, so let's, um, let us move in towards the Council of Elrond. We've got a, a, a question from the discussion board that we're going to tackle first. Um, but, uh, we are going to be looking at the convening of the Great Council. Um, and uh, a question I want to come back to, uh, maybe not right away, but, uh, the title of this chapter, uh, is kind of interesting. Why is it called the Council of Elrond. Why, why, why of Elrond specifically? I mean, he does sort of preside over it, um, but it's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, we'll um, uh, we'll uh, we'll think about that and look at that as we sort of move along. Um, it is his house. I agree, it's his house, uh, and that kind of gives him like a sort of bragging rights, I suppose. Um, but, um, it still strikes me as, well, I don't want to say odd because I don't necessarily think it's like weird. I just think it's interesting. Um, uh, but, uh, okay. Anyway, 
<laughs> we will. I want to. I want to just. I want to kind of throw that question out there for us to be thinking about as we go through. You know. So let's mull this question over over the course of the uh, of the next year. See, Zeph, and the Council of Rivendell is kind of what I would have expected, honestly. Right. Um, it's not uncommon to name a council after the place where it happened. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway. Whatever. We'll, 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 we'll think about this as we go. But first, a uh, question from uh, Storied Past, really more of an observation uh, from Storied Past, but I thought it was, it was, it was very interesting. Um, Storied Past is just, was saying that he had just gotten up to the passage with uh, Bilbo and Frodo in the ring in the Hall of Fire and um, was thinking about what uh, the sort of the motivations behind Bilbo's reaction. And he was, he began by thinking about the parallel to the mo so, so a parallel moment, the moment when Bilbo is sort of like saying, put the ring away, right? When he is turning away from his desire for the ring, the desire that was clearly drawing him to say, Hey, can I have a look at the ring? Right. And then he sees what happens to Frodo and he says, I understand now put it away. Right. So that moment when Bilbo is turning away from his object of desire and he was, and so story pass began by paralleling that with the moment when he gives up the Arkenstone in The Hobbit, um, which was very much an object of desire for himself. Remember the powerful desire that he feels for the Arkenstone when he pockets it at the beginning, right? When he first finds it uh, and thinks that he would rather have this than even if he could have nothing else in the entire horde, right? Um, but then he gives it up. And why does he give it up? He gives it up in order to stop the war, in order to prevent the suffering and death of the people around him. So he goes on and says, Empathy seems to be a driving force in all of Bilbo's life. He can succumb to desire and is perfectly willing and able to refashion the truth afterward to make himself look better. See the story of the birthday present and even the story he tells himself when he first takes the Arkenstone. That is, remember, he tries to justify it by thinking like, you know, I'll set that against my share that's do me, right? He knows it. Thorin really wants that, but kind of talks himself into the vague idea that he, like, that it's okay for him to, for him to take it and keep it. And on his own, he is perhaps never able or willing to change or even see it. So it's, again, the, the, these kinds of lies that he tells others and, and, and tells himself. Um, they, they all seem to, they, they seem to stick with him. Um, and I, I, I agree. See Rivendell, where the first thing he does is ask to see the ring because he hasn't really listened to anything that any of the wisest people in Middle Earth have been trying to teach him for 18 years. Agreed. Agreed. But when push comes to shove and he sees that other people are suffering, Gollum, Thorin, Frodo, he breaks free and makes uniquely brave and noble choices. And he does this 100% of the time, almost without even hesitating. Beyond just pity, I think it's a deep empathy, which he may not even understand himself. And that empathy drives the most important choices he makes throughout his life and basically guarantees his happily ever after fairy tale ending. He can't turn bad because when it comes to it, his empathy for other struggles wins out over his own self-interest. Does this sound right? And can we infer anything from it about how Tolkien himself saw the character of Bilbo? Um, yeah, I think that this is uh, a, a great observation. The one thing that I would say, or the one kind of clarification that I would make, um, uh, Storied Past was talking about this sort of, this deep empathy for the suffering of others being sort of beyond just pity. I would actually, the one clarification I would, I, that is pity. That's what pity is. When we talk about the pity of Bilbo, pity, pity gets a really, really bad rap in modern society. Everybody, nobody likes pity, right? Um, like if you feel pity for somebody or show pity for somebody, it's almost like something to be ashamed of, right? Um, nobody likes pity. Nobody speaks well of pity. Um, but that is in fact what pity is. Pity is empathy for the suffering of others. Pity is not like an act of pity. Showing pity towards others is acknowledging the suffering of others. That's, that's what it's about. Um, that's what, that's, that's the heart, um, of what pity is. Um, and it's true. See that, 
the, 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 one of the reasons that I think people object to pity is that pity is usually shown towards someone who is suffering by somebody who isn't suffering, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what it means, right? To feel pity for someone. But that's not a bad thing. Like if you are yourself not suffering, but you are struck by, you are convicted by the suffering of somebody else, that's a good thing. That's, that's, you, sh that's how you should feel, right? And it's clearly, it is the thing, um, that, um, uh, that, that, uh, marks Bilbo, right? And that is the thing that, that, you know, the pity of Bilbo, which will rule the, the fate of many. Um, um, yeah, I, pity is, pity was always, uh, held to be a good thing. It's, it's really in fairly modern times that pity, uh, has, uh, so, you know, like the, you know, I don't need your pity. Well, what do you want then instead? You know, like, uh, <laughs> my, my indifference, uh, the, it's, um, yeah, mad violinist. I agree. It's, it's about, um, uh, pity has taken on a connotation of superiority. It, it there's, there's, it is taken to be an element of condescension, right? And again, I think it's because, because there is inequality in it, right? Again, it is, it is the reaction of the, um, it's, it's not just like solidarity. It's not fellow feeling, right? This is not one sufferer relating to another sufferer, right? That's not what pity is about. It's not to say that if you are suffering, you know, you don't qualify to feel pity. Um, it genuine, it generally is someone who is outside of your circumstances, someone who is not experiencing the pain and the suffering that you are feeling, having feeling, showing empathy and caring about the fact that you are suffering. Um, and Tony, that's always been my understanding as well, that it comes out of a desire for egalitarianism, this sort of, this, this, this sense, this, and uh, very, not uniquely American, but very strong in American culture, um, resentment of like anything that suggests that you're, you know, different from me or better than me. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's, hard <laughs> that's it, it's it's it, often a very good thing but it often is not a good thing um and i think it's um um it's i uh, kind of it, it's often i think destructive and this i think is one of them i mean pity pity is a very very good thing because uh, you know I mean, the other thing that i would say um, or rather, I would just emphasize about Story Past's point here is that pity is, I don't know, it's optional, right? I, not only is Bilbo not compelled to show or feel pity for the suffering that he sees in these other people, his own self-interest, his own desire in these cases, very, very strong desire, is pointing him in exactly the other direction. When he has pity for Gollum, he has all kinds of reason, right, uh, to just stab him and put his eyes out instead of showing pity for him. Right. He has all kinds of, I mean, he, he has all kinds of reasons for that. In fact, if you'll notice, um, Remember when Bill, when, when Frodo says to Gandalf that it was a pity that Bilbo didn't stab the vile creature when he had the chance, right? Um, Gandalf says, you know, pity. It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy not to strike without need, right? Mercy. Bilbo showed mercy in not killing Gollum. Gandalf doesn't say, what? Murder Gollum? That would have been wrong. That would have been like, an evil, evil act for him to have stabbed Gollum. Uh, no, like an argument can easily be made that if Bilbo had attacked and killed Gollum in his attempt to escape the cave, it would have been justifiable. Gollum was trying to, in fact, kill him, right? And was fully intending to eat him and had, in fact, although Bilbo says to himself that Gollum hadn't really tried to kill him Really, he had. Bill was wrong about that. Gollum was coming straight at him with full intention to kill him. Um, anyway, it's uh, uh, it's uh, exactly JJ. That's precisely what I was thinking. Mercy means not giving somebody the punishment that they deserve. Bilbo, it, it you know, uh, Bilbo's killing of Gollum would have been defensible. Um, 
but it was an act of mercy not to kill him. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, um, uh, yeah, hang on a second. I'm having issues here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, my, uh, There we go. All right. My phone was suddenly having issues. Um, yeah. Um, so, but anyway, but so, but, but he goes beyond mercy, right? Uh, and feels pity for Gollum. And when again, he has all kinds of reasons not to with the Arkenstone, with the ring, right? These are the two, two of the examples that we get, probably the two greatest examples that we get of Bilbo. Um, feeling very, very strong. He is gripped by desire. And in fact, um, when he is, when Bilbo is, um, oh, darn it. Sorry. Uh, when Bilbo is, is, uh, with the Arkenstone, um, when he gives the Arkenstone away, he's, fighting off the dragon sickness. The dragon sickness is affecting everyone. He is the only one who succeeds in throwing off the dragon sickness. And it is his pity. It is his desire uh, to prevent the suffering of others, even those whom he suspects are not going to be pleased with him and who, in fact, immediately afterwards tries, you know, uh, threatens to throw him to his death. Um, so, again, his his pity is it's not only not automatic it's it's extremely costly in all of those all of those three times with Gollum with Thorin and with Frodo um Bilbo's pity is very difficult and very costly and yet he sides with his um uh, his empathy right he sides with the uh you know he he kind of takes the side of the 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 suffering of the people so i agree that is that is his impulse and it is it's um i don't know it's kind of easy i think so storied past i was really grateful for your comment because i think this really does emphasize a very very important point about bilbo and you're right he's got a 100 percent ratio here i mean does he ever have this kind of an opportunity does he ever see the suffering of somebody else like this and not react in this way even in these remarkable heroic ways right i mean he he puts all of the rest of them at the Battle of Five Armies to shame, right? He does better than everybody else. The Elven King, Bard, Thorn, and all of them, right? He becomes the only person in recorded history actually to give up the ring, right? And in a sense, does so almost twice. I mean, that moment, the put it away moment with Frodo, it's almost, this is almost like him giving up the ring a second time, right? It's very, very remarkable. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. So it's just to say that, uh, you know, Bilbo has. I, so I think re emphasizing the significance of that pity and what that tells us about his character is, I think, uh, an excellent and really important thing. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah, Tony, it is really interesting to think what Bilbo would have done uh, if he'd been at the scouring, right? And, you know, when we get there, uh, you know, Frodo, Tolkien makes the choice to have Frodo spend almost all of his time preventing people from killing people, right? Preventing hobbits uh, from killing more than is necessary, right? I mean, they 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 fight to defend their lives, uh, and so you know many of the ruffians are killed. Um, but Frodo runs around trying to prevent to prevent all the fighting that he can, and when he can't prevent fighting, prevent all the killing that he can. Um, so anyway, I, I think that that's that does seem to me, uh, Tony, something very like what Bilbo himself might have done. Um, you know. It's not like the Battle of Five Armies, where he could try to do something to prevent any fighting, right? I don't think that there was any way that that could have happened. Um, uh, 
you know, you're not, in fact, going to save the Shire just by being shocked and sad, as Mary says. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Matt points out that um, it's a similar move with, uh, uh, with Randul that gets him named Elf Friend. Bilbo, yeah, yeah. Um, even his, uh, his generosity to Thranduil. Um, I mean, there's, of course, a, a kind of scrupulous honesty to it, right? He's paying for his, his, uh, the, the room and board that the Elven King gave him unwittingly. Um, but, um, but he certainly doesn't have to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Um, so anyway, thank you, Storage Pass, for bringing that up. That was a, that was an excellent reminder. Let's start the chapter. Next day, Frodo woke early, feeling refreshed and well. He walked along the terraces above the loud-flowing Bruinen and watched the pale, cool sun rise above the far mountains and shine down, slanting through the thin silver mist. The dew upon the yellow leaves was glimmering, and the woven nets of gossamer twinkled on every bush. Sam walked beside him, saying nothing, but sniffing the air, and looking every now and again with wonder in his eyes at the great heights in the east. The snow was white upon their peaks. On a seat cut in the stone, beside a turn in the path, they came upon Gandalf and Bilbo, deep in talk. "'Hello, good morning,' said Bilbo. "'Feel ready for the great council?' "'I feel ready for anything,' answered Frodo. "'But most of all, I should like to go walking today and explore the valley. I should like to get into those pine woods up there.' He pointed away, far up the side of Rivendell, to the north. "'You may have a chance later,' said Gandalf. "'But we cannot make any plans yet. There is much to hear and decide today.' Um, yeah, uh, Arden Crayon, this is really lovely scene setting, right? Um, one of the things that really struck me reviewing these passages today is we get, of course, like the frame, you know, a frame for this chapter, though it's quite a brief frame, right? We are, we are into the council quite quickly. Um, but we do get these moments. It's like the Valley of Rivendell itself is um the valley of rivendell itself is a really important character at the beginning of this um uh of this whole scene of the, of the council right this was something that really struck me this time uh, that i hadn't really thought about before um part of this of course we are seeing frodo's own reactions yesterday of course he we saw him Seeing his friends again, of course, right? And meeting people, in, including people out of legends, not only his own family legends like Glowin, but, um, but of course people like Elrond and Arwen, right? And Glorfindel, um, whom he'd already met, obviously. But anyway, it was mostly the meeting of the people. And in the Hall of Fire, and as they're leaving the Hall of Fire, we get that, uh, that, recognition of like i am in the house of elrond right this is here i am hanging out at the you know at the table and and in the hall of fire afterwards um here now for almost the first time we, we only we, the only description the, the only major description we got of the valley was like through the window right of frodo's room before um his experience of the valley here um i think is really beautiful and it's clear that it is it is striking him in ways that it didn't before um and this also seems to be you know in, in one way you could read the rest of that first paragraph as a kind of gloss on the first sentence right he woke early feeling refreshed and well um remember the one of the chief symptoms of his previous illness right his morgul knife induced illness was that grayness that was uh coming between him and the world between him and his friends was one of the chief emphases but he was unable to see the world around him now uh he is seeing the world around him in great detail and of course he is surrounded by uh by by peacefulness and beauty um but and but not just that, right? Very striking peacefulness and beauty, um, especially with the high mountains, um, which 
Frodo has functionally never seen before. You can see the mountains as you approach from a distance, but Frodo was in no state to do that. You'll remember in The Hobbit, when Bilbo first sees the misty mountains looming up in the distance and says, and says you know, um, uh, you know, is that the mountain? Are we almost there? Uh, Frodo doesn't have that experience because he was already under the uh, the influence of the Morgul blade uh, at that point. Um We've got the loud flowing Bruinen and the pale, cool sun. Notice the different sensory imagery, the different sensory imagery that we get, right? We get the, uh, the, the, the sound imagery of the sound of the Bruinen flowing, right? The pale, cool sun, which gives us both visual and tactile image, right? It's the, uh, that he's feeling the sunlight on him, but the sunlight is, the, the sun isn't hot, right? Uh, it's a pale, cool sun. Um, uh, and the, the sun is, shining down, slanting through the thin silver mist. The dew upon the yellow leaves was glimmering, and the woven nets of gossamer twinkled on every bush. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> I agree, um, Tony. Uh, uh, the uh, loud flowing Bruinen is almost a pun, as of course Bruinen means loud water. Um, and yeah, Fourth Dauntless, I also agree. This scene really emphasizes Frodo's resilience. It's his first day up and about, and he already wants to take a challenging hike up through the mountains. Yes. Uh, yes, very true. Um, yeah. Um, notice that many of the things that Frodo is noticing are things that are, in a sense, familiar right? That is the morning sun, uh, the silver, the thin silver mist, uh, in the very beginning of the day, uh, the dew upon the yellow leaves, the woven nets of gossamer twinkling. Remember, we got the reference to the, uh, the, the spider webs catching the mist in Buckland as they were leaving, right? When they were leaving before the break of day, while it was still dark, uh, in Buckland, we also had, um, the uh the nets of the uh the spider webs catching the the droplets of moisture and showing up silvery there um so again the, my my point is this it's 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 very beautiful some of that beauty is beauty just like you would see in the shire right but then like sam you look every now and again with wonder in your eyes at the great heights in the east right so you're surrounded uh, by the mountains. This is not just a morning stroll in the Shire. Um, this is a morning in the um, uh, in the Valley of Rivendell. Um, yeah, yeah. So, feel ready for the Great Council. Frodo says, most of all, I should like to go walking today and explore the valley. Now, I do agree with Fourth Dauntless that this shows how quickly uh, he is recovering, right? Yeah, Tony, oh yes, Tony, you're right. Uh, Sam sniffing the air, totally sniffing the elf smell, right? Because Rivendell does smell like elves, right? It presumably still does, uh, as, you know, it, it smelled like elves when Bilbo came into it, and I'm sure it still does, and, I, and I'm sure that Sam, of all people is appreciating right you know he's sniffing the air elves sir right totally totally um yeah good belongsman points out that bilbo calls it the great council uh he doesn't yet call it uh the council of elrond um <laughs> Arden Cran, you're right. That uh, elf-scented car fresheners would be a really cool merch object. I'm not sure how to handle that one, though. I mean, I'm pretty sure I know what elves smell like, but I don't know that we could bottle it. I'm really not sure of that. Um, Gandalf's comment, we cannot make any plans yet, is interesting, too. Um... Is Gandalf suggesting that there's a non-zero chance that they're going to, like, leave straight after the council? I wonder, right? We cannot make any plans. Or is he just preparing Frodo to say, like, um, Frodo's words are... Um, um, 
Frodo's words are sort of the words of like a vacationer, right? Uh, like somebody who is like at the resort for the first, day, you know, on, on, on the first morning and thinking about the things that he would really like to do while he's here. Um, are Gandalf's words designed to basically plant the idea in Frodo? Um, don't, um, don't start thinking like a tourist yet, right? Uh, you might still be on a business trip. After all, your, your job might not be done. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is not a hobbit walking party. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It doesn't say it in those words, but, uh, but that does seem to be the, the, the kind of implication there. Um, Let's keep going. Look at how Rivendell continues, the valley continues to be the focal point. Suddenly, as they were talking, a single clear bell rang out. That is the warning bell for the Council of Elrond, cried Gandalf. Come along now. Both you and Bilbo are wanted. Frodo and Bilbo followed the wizard quickly along the winding path back to the house. Behind them, uninvited and for the moment forgotten, trotted Sam. Gandalf led them to the porch where Frodo had found his friends the evening before. The light of the clear autumn morning was now glowing in the valley. The noise of bubbling waters came up from the foaming riverbed. Birds were singing, and a wholesome peace lay on the land. To Frodo, his dangerous flight, and the rumors of the darkness growing in the world outside, already seemed only the memories of a troubled dream, but the faces that were turned to meet them as they entered were grave. Um, okay, so it's Gandalf who names it the Council of Elrond, right? Um, that is the warning bell for the Council of Elrond, says Gandalf with capital letters, right? Like Gandalf has already titled it, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and for Thoughtless, you're right. Tolkien reminds us that Sam is still trotting along behind, right? Uh, everybody else forgets about him, but uh, uh, but we are reminded that he's still there. Um, Elrond is certainly calling the council, and he is chairing the council. Um, but uh, one of the things that I can't help but think of here is that... There's almost a, a kind of, uh, there's almost a pun here, potentially, right? Uh, that is a council pun, right? Um, the, everyone has come to seek the council, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, of Elrond, right? They've all come to Elrond for advice, Boromir explicitly. Right, Thranduil has come, or, or sorry, Legolas has come from Thr Thranduil with a message. Um, uh, Glowen has come, right, to ask Elrond for advice. Um, uh, d you know, to seek the the uh, a haven in Rivendell, and you know, uh, 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 further advice on what to do was Frodo's initial quest, right, that he agreed on with Gandalf. Um, so, in that sense, Elrond is. The natural focal point more than just being, you know, the host of the festivities uh, on that particular day. Um, so in that sense, I think it. I think it does. I mean, I'm not saying it's nonsensical that it's called the Council of Elrond. I just think it's interesting. Anyway, okay. Come along now. Both you and Bilbo are wanted. Um, And they follow him along the winding path back to the house. Sam trots along behind. Why do you think he does? Why do you think Sam is trotting along behind? Um, remember, exactly, Belong Spawn, that's what I was thinking too. Um, spying on Mr. Frodo is a thing with Sam, right? I mean, he is an extremely trustworthy servant, but uh, he has um, 
uh, he has a, a little eavesdropping history, right? Um, yeah, Fort Dauntless says he's acting like Frodo's valet. He's following along until he's told he's not wanted. Um, yes, though Gandalf has just said that. Politely, right? Both you and Bilbo are wanted, he says, pointedly not including Sam in the invitation, right? Um, uh, that's, you know, Gandalf has in fact just said, uh, yeah, he did not, he specifically did not say that Sam is also, uh, Sam is also wanted in this. Um, uh, now you're right, mad violinist servants are used to not being specifically mentioned. Um, he's got deniability. It's fine. Like, I'm not, um, um, yeah, he's, he's not wanted, but not forbidden, Mudmore. Yeah, it's, it's true. He's not been explicitly barred, uh, from attendance. Um, He has given his word not to leave Frodo. Uh, uh, Tony, I agree. Um, well, we'll come back to this question when Sam does finally contribute, right, to the council and is discovered. Um, but, um, yeah. Now, Bruinier points out that or asks, did Gandalf know that Sam would follow? I think that's a really good question. Um, I have to think, by the way, I have to think that Gandalf knows. I don't think that Sam is... No, uninvited and for the moment forgotten trotted Sam. Trotted is the verb, right? Um... He's trotting along. They're all moving quickly, right? The, the, uh, Bil Frodo and Bilbo follow the wizard quickly, right? So all the hobbits are kind of trotting along as, as, uh, Gandalf is, uh, moving briskly down the path, right? Um, Sam is not exactly sneaking here, right? Um, I think it's very reasonable to imagine that Gandalf knows full well that Sam is trotting along behind. Um, he just came along and says, Gandalf, right, had just said, okay, come along now, both you and Bilbo are wanted. A and made no provision for Sam, right? Didn't, I mean, again, does he not, again, I think he notices. I think that Gandalf does not mind at all Sam being present here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Mike says, I will never hear trot and not think of wooden shoes ever again in my life. Yeah, yeah, true enough, true enough. Um, yes, my theory is that Gandalf certainly knows that Sam is coming along to the council, and I can't imagine that Elrond is unaware of Sam's entrance. Again, I don't think Sam is like, you know, experienced conspirator he may be. You know, ninja spy Sam is really not, necessarily. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he won't call attention to his own intelligence agent. Yeah. Uh, perhaps not. Um, He does do fine as a spy, Bruinier, generally. I agree. Um, uh, Zephan is wondering, is the, uh, he was summoned and you were not lying potentially more hobbitry from Elrond? Increasingly, uh, Zephan, yeah, that's kind of how I'm interpreting that line. Um, uh, well, look what happens when they get there. Um, well, before we do that, well, no, we'll get to that at the end. We'll come back to this in a second. No, actually, let's skip ahead to it. Look at the end of the paragraph when they get there. Um, but the faces that were turned to meet them as they entered were grave. They are the focus as the, they troop in, 
right? Gandalf and Bilbo and Frodo with Sam trotting along behind, right? As they troop in, everyone in the whole room is looking at you. You're telling nobody, nobody, none of the elves in that room, Gorfindel, Legolas, Aristor, none of them spotted Sam coming in behind and like sitting quietly by the door or wherever he, uh, wherever he was, right? I mean, they all look over in that direction. Again, I just, I, I, you, you know how much I love Sam, but I just don't think that Sam has successfully, um, uh, you know, sneaked in past absolutely everybody. Um, I just, I just, um, I don't buy that. But anyway, look at the, 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 the emphasis on the peace of the valley again. Gandalf led them to the porch where Frodo had found his friends the evening before. So the place of reunion, right? The place where he had run back into Merry and Pippin again, um, where Pippin was saying uh, unwise things and Gandalf was scolding him. That's where the council is being held. Um, and that's itself an interesting kind of conjunction. Uh, Rivendell is presumably a fairly large place. Um, there's no presumably absolute necessity for them to double up locations, right? For, for this to be, I mean, he could have decided to place the council in a, some kind of council place that Frodo hadn't seen yet, as we know he's not seen a whole lot of Rivendell yet, and yet it's not. It's in one of the few places he's already been to, and the one which was associated with happiness, reunion, right? The celebration of, uh, you know, sort of the resumption of their fellowship. That seems like a big deal. Um, yeah, you guys are still talking about Elrond's hobbitry. Well, hang on. We've not gotten there yet, right? We'll get back to that in a few months. Um, so that's the first thing that we get, that the his merry meeting with his friends is the like geographic context for the council. And then we get the description. The light of the clear autumn morning was now glowing in the valley. The noise of bubbling waters came up from the foaming riverbed. Birds were singing and a wholesome peace lay on the land. Um, that clause there in the middle and a wholesome peace lay on the land seems to me to be the pivotal part of this entire paragraph, right? The description leads up to that. The light of the clear autumn morning was now glowing in the valley. The noise of bubbling waters came up from the foaming riverbed. Birds were singing. A wholesome peace lay on the land, right? Notice that it's, it's almost like it's something superimposed over the land, right? It's like, it's, it's, this is like a value added thing, right? Um, it's not just that the land is peaceful. Um, a peace lies on the land and it's a wholesome peace that lies on the land. And then we see, uh, further context. So we get the, the description. Then we get the, 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 that central clause about the wholesome peace. And then we get, to Frodo, his dangerous flight and the rumors of the darkness growing in the world outside already seemed only the memories of a troubled dream. There is something about Rivendell. There is something about this, the beauty and the peacefulness of Liv this wholesome peace that lies on the land, which drives away dark, not just dark things, but dark thoughts. His dangerous flight. So the memories of his suffering, his fear, and his pain, that begins to seem like the memories of a dream. The rumors of the darkness growing in the world outside, so the darkness that lies behind and the darkness that lies ahead, right? Both of those things fade into the background or are sort of <laughs> smothered. It's perhaps not a good metaphor for what's being what's being described here. I was going to say smothered by the wholesome peace that lies over the land, um, but it's more uh, benevolent than that. Tony, I absolutely agree. This is the influence of Elrond's power, right? Um, remember in The Hobbit, we get this one simple sentence that I find really striking. Um, Evil things did not come to that valley, 
period. Right? Like that's evil things don't come there. That's it's not like evil things are afraid of the valley or evil things generally avoid the valley or um you know, evil things uh like get super nervous when they're near the valley. Like evil things don't come like it's just it doesn't happen. It's not possible. And this uh that description of Frodo's own internal experience of the morning there in Rivendell shows us that that's even true of evil thoughts, right? Um, dark things don't, dark things have no place here, can take no root there. And I agree, Mad Violinist, um, um, and, uh, you know, Matt, as you are uh, suggesting as well, um, we will see differences with Galadriel's ring, right? Um, it's not going to be the same with her as it is with Elrond. Um, yeah, good. Um, okay. Good. Let's see. Uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah. Well, we'll do some more comparison when we get there. And then we get to find the final but. But the faces that were turned to meet them as they entered were grave. So we're going to talk about serious things. And they're already thinking about serious things. Um, evil might seem unreal there, right? Um, but evil still is real. Uh, so we're thinking about it, and uh, but... Uh, the, there's there's still this kind of buffer against it. Cecilia, I agree with you that uh, uh, she says Elrond knows that troubling things are going to be talked about. Um, what we're we're better to be than in such a peaceful place. Um, uh, if we must talk about trouble, let's do it where we can remember uh, the good things of the world. And it's even more than remembering them, right? I mean, there is there really is a kind of uh, uh, a kind of buffer around them, right? Um, yes, they're at peace, but not untroubled. Um, they are able to discuss these things without the present oppression of fear or dread, right? They don't have that. Um, and yes, uh, Cecilia, I agree. And someone was referring to that in the Discord chat as well, how these descriptions of Rivendell, um, uh, can remind us of the description of Elrond in The Hobbit, that he was kind as, as summer, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And yes, Valori, you are right. We should uh, remember these descriptions, not only of the beauty of Rivendell, but of this wholesome peace that lies on the land. We should remember this later on when uh, uh, Elrond gets a little upset at Gandalf later on during the, uh, during the council. Right. Um, okay. Um, let's keep going. It's our first session. It's already a three slide day. How about that? Elrond was there and several others were seated in silence about him. Frodo saw Glorfindel and Glowen and in a corner alone, Strider was sitting clad in his old travel worn clothes again. Elrond drew Frodo to a seat by his side and presented him to the company, saying, Here, my friends, is the hobbit, Frodo, son of Drogo. Few have ever come hither through greater peril or on an errand more urgent. He then pointed out and named those whom Frodo had not met before. There was a younger dwarf at Glowen's side, his son Gimli. Before Glorfindel, beside Glorfindel, there were several other counselors of Elrond's household, of whom Aristor was the chief. And with him was Galdor, an elf from the Grey Havens, who had come on an errand from Cirdan the Shipwright. There was also a strange elf clad in green and brown, Legolas, a messenger from his father, Thranduil, the king of the elves of northern Mirkwood. And seated a little apart was a tall man with a fair and noble face, dark-haired and grey-eyed, proud and stern of glance. He was cloaked and booted as if for a journey on horseback, and indeed, though his garments were rich, and his cloak was lined with fur, they were stained with long travel. He had a collar of silver, in which a single white stone was set. His locks were shorn about his shoulders. 
On a baldric he wore a great horn tipped with silver that was now laid upon his knees. He gazed at Frodo and Bilbo with sudden wonder. Here, said Elrond, turning to Gandalf, is Boromir, a man from the south. He arrived in the grey morning and seeks for counsel. I have bidden him to be present, for here his questions will be answered. Um, okay, good. So, first of all, uh, Ardent Cran, I saw that you were, uh, your post uh, on the discussion board, um, noticing how there are, is, there are apparently a number of people from Elrond's house. We, uh, we have an indeterminate number of miscellaneous elves who don't get named at this council. And Arden Cran was drawing attention to the uh, fact that only Aristor gets named. We are told explicitly that Elrond introduces by name the people that Frodo hadn't met before. And I have to imagine that includes everybody that he hasn't met before. So if we are not told who the other non-Aristor counselors are, um, uh, if we, um, if we're not told that, um, that seems to be a choice by the narrator, not a choice by Elrond. I don't think that Elrond has just blown off all of the other counselors of his court. Uh, that seems, that seems really clear. Um, that is, however, and I'm, I think it was um, uh, Anthony Lawler who is responding on that and saying um, that it's this is a pattern that we can see. Remember, we were only told the name of one elf of the group of elves that they met in the Shire, right? Um, and there and there, there 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 are several times when we are introduced to groups of people and only told that, like this we're only told the name of Lindir, um, even though there are a group of elves sitting around and listening to Bilbo. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Thinking about the oh yeah sorry Mudmore I was making a very lame joke there uh, my pun on roll call um, Mad Violinist is asking me do I suppose if Lindir is there I don't know I, I would guess that he would have been named because we'd already been introduced to him um, but uh, so I think he's probably not here um, but um, anyway so my lame joke my lame role pun um, there in the in the t in subtitle of this slide um, was thinking about the the kind of there's a kind of representative uh, you know it's this is not quite a meeting of delegates but if it were officially a meeting of delegates it would look a lot like this right um, and that's really an interesting thing it seems to be one of the things that Tolkien emphasizes in his descriptions. And honestly, I would say that seems to me a very good reason all by itself, not to mention, not to list the other names, as now I'm forgetting it was, there were several contributors to that thread um, uh, that Arden Crayon started about the uh, about the, the unnamed elves. Um, so I forget who it was, Arden Crayon, maybe it was you, um, who was saying that uh, somebody was saying that it's kind of common. It's it's fairly common in things like uh, Norse sagas and things to to be like. And now let us interrupt this story to give you the catalog of the names of the people who were there. Um, and I agree that is a very common. That's a very medieval touch. And Tolkien specifically doesn't do that, right? Um, I think the reason that there are several reasons. I, I suspect for this, um, but one of the one of the consequences of that choice is that we end up getting more of an emphasis on the individual roles. On the again, like the each one represents a sort of a different population in a sense, right? We get Gorfindel, and he's kind of in his own special category, 
right? So we got Elrond and Gorfindel and they're in their own special category. Then we need somebody else who represents like the elves of Elrond's house who are not Gorfindel or Elrond. And we get that in Aristor. And then we need another elf from the, we, we get another elf from the Grey Havens, right? So we've got the, we've got the, uh, you know, the elves of the Havens represented. And we've got an elf of Mirkwood present. And we've got a man from the south present. And we've got Aragorn there on behalf of the Rangers and the Dunedain. And we've got Bilbo and Frodo, so the Shire is double represented, though I guess Bilbo has kind of joint citizenship at this point. Um, um, yeah. So, uh, it, it's it's... The description ends up reading that way, which would be much less so if we had like an imbalanced long list of names of the people of Elrond's house, right? So let's imagine there are six other, I don't know, I don't know, but let's imagine there are six other elves who are not Aristor, who are also present at the council. I wouldn't find that shocking, right? Elrond, Gorfindel, Aristor, and six other dudes, right? So we've got nine elves of Rivendell plus the other people. If you just went down and listed them all by name, we wouldn't have this same... Oh, I forgot Glowen and Gimli, of course. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, I, I definitely I definitely think that we would not have that same sense of um, each one uh, sort of coming from a different place in Middle Earth, representing a different little sort of niche of the free peoples uh, of of Middle Earth. Um, so that's certainly one of the consequences of not naming the non-Aristor uh, uh, Rivendell counselors there. Now, uh, I think... Um, who was that? Tim? Was it you? Who I think was... Um, uh, who was emphasizing that, uh, you know, how much screen time Boromir gets, right? How much... Uh, how how suddenly fixated we get, right? I mean, it can't just be that we've never seen him before, because we've never seen Legolas before either. We've never seen Gimli before. Gimli, you know, whatever. We know his dad, right? And he's Gimli's only interesting because he's got a famous dad at this point. Um, but Legolas is just as much a stranger, and frankly, somebody you'd think. Frodo might pay even more attention to because he's another one of those, well, sort of peripherally famous people, just like Glowen is famous, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, Glowen is part of Bilbo's old stories that Frodo was grown up, uh, you know, was, was raised he, on hearing. The Elven King of Mirkwood, right, is another. So the son of the Elven King of Mirkwood, you'd think if like random dude from the South and son of the Elven King of Mirkwood, if, you know, Frodo's introduced to those two, you'd think he'd pay more attention to the, the elf dude, right? Um, but that's not what the attention of the narrative focuses on, right? The attention instead is drawn to Boromir, and we get a full description. Of Elrond, we're only told that he's clad in green and brown, and he's identified, right? Um, but we're not told. Um, but we're told like a great deal more, right, about Boromir. We get this full description of him. Um, notice, by the way, that uh, somebody was just saying that um, uh, Legolas and Boromir are both crown princes of their realms. Bricktails was saying that. Well, that is true, but we don't know that yet. Notice uh, Elrond just says, here's Boromir, a man from the south. So yeah, he's a Boromir, random southerner. <laughs> Legolas is introduced as the as uh, a messenger from his father, Thranduil, the king of the elves of northern Mirkwood. Boromir is not even called Boromir, a messenger from his father, or you know, he's, we're not even told that he's a messenger from the Lord of Minas Tirith, right? He could be a vagabond from the south, for all we know, right? He could be you know, a wandering scissors sharpener from the south who happened to have come up to, to Rivendell, you know, seeking the answer to some question. Um, we are not told anything about him. Um, uh, 
other than that he's from the south and he seeks for counsel. I have bidden him to be present, for here his questions will be answered. So I invited him, he says. Right. Um, yeah, a couple of you are wondering or speculating, like, did he ask his identity to be suppressed? Uh, maybe. Maybe. It doesn't sound like a very Boromir thing to do, though. Can you imagine Boromir being like, dude, I'm trying to keep a low profile here. If you could just not mention the fact that I am the son of the steward of Gondor, I'd appreciate it. I don't like to draw attention to myself, and I'm above proclaiming my identity in front of strangers. Um, yeah, no. I mean, it's true he doesn't trust foreigners. I agree with that. But um, I, 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 I can't think that Boromir has asked for, you know, Elrond to preserve his identity. Um, so, Boromir, he of the stern, of the proud and stern glance, can't be best pleased by this introduction, right? He can't. Um, yeah, okay, hang on. Question. Um... Somebody look up in Appendix B. How... Was Boromir born yet when Aragorn was in Gondor? I mean, I know it was a while back, but I don't remember exactly the dates. Was Boromir still, like, in diapers, or was he not... Was he... Was he... Was he... Was it till... Was it before Denethor was married? I can't remember. Boromir is, like, three or four? Okay. Okay. That's what I, I thought that he was, I thought that they overlapped. That, uh, that Aragorn would have known, like, toddler Boromir. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Matt, I agree. This has got to be all kinds of awkward for Boromir. Because not only is he not, like, the big important guy at the council, which he's going to be very used to being, He's almost dismissed at the beginning, right? A man from the South. Whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, his description. A tall man with a fair and noble face. Dark haired. Ha! Notice that. Remember our fairness discussion? There is a very emphatic use of fair meaning beautiful, right? Not fair meaning blonde, right? Uh, a fair face, dark haired and gray eyed, proud and stern of glance. Um, cloaked and booted as if for a journey on horseback. So he's just like, just gotten off his horse recently. You know, this is, this is like, so, you know, sitting at the table here, um, uh, to um, have the council is like the first time he's sat down since his since his journey, right? Um, okay, Boromir was two. Great. Okay, there we go. Um, right, he lost his horse at Tharbad, right? Sorry, of course, right? He's not been riding for a while, so he just came walking into Rivendell. Um, uh, yeah, now Arden Crayon, that's a really good observation. Um, the way Boromir is introduced makes him seem like Strider 2.0. Yeah, a little bit. It is a little bit reminiscent of the description of Strider that we got in the common room of the Prancing Pony. Um, seated a little apart was a tall man with a fair and noble face, except he's hotter than Aragorn, right? I mean, he has a beautiful face at the beginning. Beautiful and noble. Aragorn did not look... Strider did not look noble when he was sitting. He looked sketchy, not noble. Um... um and proud and stern of glance. Good. Kurtzimus is reminding us that while Strider's gl glance was keen in the Inn at Bree, um, uh, Boromir's is stern, right? Um, yes. So, Bruin here, I'd certainly agree. Boromir, though he is also, you know, looking weather-worn and travel-stained like Strider, right? Um he does look more more 
uh, more kingly. Uh, <laughs> WKU uh, is saying maybe he looks fair but feels foul. Possibly, right? He does look fair. He certainly looks fair. Um, the pride and sternness of his glance, I don't know if that quite translates to feeling foul. I guess we'd have to ask Sam, who's still, you know, doing his uh, ninja thing by the door. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, he hasn't spent enough time in the wilderness to look like Strider. No, but he's spent a fair good time in the wilderness. I mean, he's, he's, he's pretty rough. Um, cloaked and booted as if for a journey on horseback and indeed so his garments are rich again he 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 looks you can tell this guy comes for money right he's not a beggar he's not in rags but you know and his cloak is lined with fur really nice cloak right but stained with long travel he's wearing a silver collar in which a single white stone was set so he's got bling as well as his fur lined cloak his locks were shorn about his shoulders. I'm not sure what to do with that. That is to say, it helps us picture him. How long is Legolas's hair? How about Gimli? How about Aragorn? How long is Aragorn's hair? Frodo? My point is... Tolkien almost never tells us this kind of thing. Uh, Tolkien is... Right, Aragorn is described as shaggy. Yeah, we get a little bit of a description. Tolkien almost never gives us a description, a physical description of somebody. What colors Pippin's hair? Do you know? I don't think I do. What, you know, I mean, it just... This is the kind of thing... Uh, we, we get a few details float through, like the length of Gandalf's eyebrows, Fourth Dauntless, absolutely. Or, um, and yes, the fact that, Rin, that as Rin Roos points out, that uh, that Frodo's hair looks like a woolen mat, right? Yeah, that that's like a, an, an interesting, indirect uh, piece of description. Or the, the description that we get from, um, uh, from Butterbur's letter, right? Um, uh you know, we don't, um, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, we're never really, my point is just, this is not the kind of thing that Tolkien tells us, generally. He gives us intimate description of landscape. He rarely gives any description of people. Um, therefore, I find myself really not sure, um, really not sure what to do with the description of Boromir's hair. His locks were shorn about his shoulders. I agree that the emphasis is on the cut, right? Um, the text isn't emphasizing Boromir's hair went all the way down to his shoulders, right? He doesn't say that. What is What our attention is drawn to is that his locks are shorn about his shoulders. Um, he, so I think, I think what we're supposed to take from that is not Boromir has long hair. It's exactly that he's well coiffed. Exactly. Boromir looks like he has a barber, <laughs> right? I don't know what everybody else's hair looks like. Again, although we do, we do know that Aragorn's is shaggy, right? Um, but, um, uh, but. I th especially in the context, right? Remember that everything else we're being told, including in that sentence, right? The first half of the sentence is about the bling around his throat, and the second half of the sentence is about how his locks are shorn, right? Um, so, yeah, Mike is asking, how can he possibly, he hasn't seen a barber in months? Well, sure, but, uh, you know, shoulder-length hair is... <laughs> it's a relatively a comparatively easy look to maintain. I don't know. Uh, I mean, my hair would look pretty different in months, right, than uh, uh, than it does right now. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I'm not sure. But again, in context, it, it, seem, it strikes me as we're supposed to interpret that 
line as telling us something more about how dapper he is, right? Um, rich garment, cloak lined with fur, collar of silver, locks shorn about his shoulders. On a baldric, he wore a great horn tipped with silver that now was laid upon his knees, right? Um, yeah, Kurtzimus, I, I agree. I, I also think that Boromir wakes up with perfect hair. I think that's clearly, I think that's clearly true. Um, <laughs> Prince Valiant hair. Maybe, maybe. Um, uh, <laughs> it is possible, it is possible that he has had a haircut or two along the way. I can't absolutely rule it. I'd be a little surprised. I mean, you know, between the gap of Rohan and, uh, and, and Rivendell, I mean, I, I have to think barbers are, I mean, unless he's lucky enough to pass a wandering scissor sharpener, he's not gonna find too many people who can cut his hair, uh, uh, in there. But, um, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go to an end for a haircut. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think so. Um, again, I don't think we're supposed to understand that Boromir is a fop, uh, but it seems to be part of the, he's kind of a fancy guy, though he, so in other words, the description of Boromir and Elrond's words about Boromir stand on their heads, right? Um, we're given the description first. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, Luke, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, though I suppose wandering barbers uh, in that part of the world were also under considerable economic stress at that period in history. Um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, so notice the thing that I emphasized first, that is Elrond's words introducing Boromir, come last, right? Look at what we're told about him. Tall man. That's important in Tolkien, right? Height, fair and noble face, proud and stern of glance, rich garments, fur-lined cloak, collar of silver with a white jewel in it, uh, locks shorn about his shoulders, which I think is fancy, on a baldric, he wore a great horn tipped with silver that was laid upon his knees, right? So he's holding this horn on his lap. I'm not going to say ostentatiously, because that's a little biased, but um, he's sort of cradling this horn like it's a big deal. And it's certainly fancy, tipped with silver. That's pretty nice. And it's a great horn. It's huge, right? This is not a small little, little horn. Um, so... I get, just if we stop there, he's um. <laughs> Dora Marthen points out that he is prepared to toot his own horn when the time comes. Um, uh, <laughs> WKU says, "You know, he wants to blow it when he's introduced." Um, yeah, maybe, maybe he's getting ready. Um, yeah, it is a mark of his office. Um, now, nobody in the house except probably, except certainly Aragorn, um, and, and, uh, Gandalf, uh, are gonna understand the significance of that horn that he's holding on his lap, right? Um, remember when Faramir asks Frodo in Ithilien, was there, was there aught of special mark, right, that Boromir, uh, bore? Uh, and Frodo immediately says, I remember that Boromir bore a horn, right? This is not just Frodo's keen eye for detail, right? Um, even implicit in Faramir's question, right, has to be the fact that, like, if you've met Boromir, you'll have noticed the horn. It will have been hard to not notice the horn if you've actually met, <laughs> met, met Boromir. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly as Rococo says, a first time reader is like, wow, who's this? And Elrond is like, some guy, <laughs> right? The, the introduction by Boromir is almost surprisingly, um, down playing, right? Boromir's significance. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> several off-color jokes about Boromir's horn being made, which I shall not repeat. Um, but uh, <laughs> have I mentioned, did, did you notice my horn? Exactly. That's very much how he's sitting, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, <laughs> sorry. JJ was saying the departure of Boromir should really have been titled Boromir Blows It. Yes, possibly, possibly so. Um, uh, anyway, so I, as I say, it's, it's interesting that, that Tolkien kind of pulls us in two directions about Boromir here. We are led to expect, we are led to perceive, to believe that Boromir is a big deal, right? And he seems to, I, by the cradling of the horn, he seems to uh, um, uh, see himself, or at least his horn, as a pretty big deal. Um, but that is not where Elrond pushes us. Um, and, and I wonder why. Is Elrond conveying a message to Boromir? Is Elrond... Um, is he... Uh, uh, yeah, F Flamifer says uh, Elrond, like Lindir, pays a little attention to the minor differences between sheep. Maybe. I don't think like Lindir, he can't really tell the difference, right? I think he knows that Boromir is a, is a big deal. Um, uh, nor do I think he's like trying to put Boromir in his place, but I wonder if he's kind of testing him a little bit. Um He's just, remember, he's just met Boromir, right? He's known Boromir for less than an hour, right? Um, and it would, does not seem to me, a, would not seem to me a strange idea, um, that he would want to, um, to test him a little bit, see what he's like. Uh, is he going to stand on his dignity? Is he going to be affronted? If I don't give him all of his fancy titles and everything, with which I feel relatively confident that Boromir must have introduced himself, right? Um, exactly. Ambrosius, Ambrosius Aurelianus, I think the same. Um, uh, says, I feel pretty confident that Elrond is perfectly able to give him an intro proper to the son of the steward of Gondor, but has chosen this intro for very specific strategic reasons. I definitely uh, think so as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And Tony, I agree. Aragorn being there is, um, got to be part of that as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Mike, that is interesting. I hadn't thought of that, but it's true. Boromir may never have melt an, met an elf or a dwarf until this past hour. Yes, and yet it's at Bilbo and Frodo uh, that he gazes with sudden wonder, right? Which is kind of interesting in itself. You'd think that, like, you know, the two little short guys coming in with uh, Gandalf would be less wonderful than, like, Glorfindel and Elrond, right? To a noob uh, who's never been among this council. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it is foreshadowing of the message that he's going to uh, to bear. But and it's true, Tony. He has had a little bit of time to stare at the elves. True enough. Um. Good, Nahor. Really good point. 
Um, Nahor says, I think the introduction is especially odd, uh, since it's directed at Gandalf, who's very aware of who Denethor is, uh, rather than at the general company, right? Exactly. Um, Gandalf is one of the few people who knows Boromir, right? I mean, he has spent time in Minas Tirith. Um, he probably knows Boromir better than everybody. In fact, if there's anybody in the room who could be doing an introduction of Boromir to everybody else, it would be Gandalf, right? And yet, here, said Elrond, turning to Gandalf, is Boromir. So Elrond is presenting Boromir to Gandalf. Um, I have bidden him be present, says Elrond to Gandalf, explaining himself to Gandalf. Um, uh, I have bidden him to be present, for here his questions will be answered. Um, <clears throat> I... Um, I think this is not targeted at Gandalf. I think this is targeted at Boromir. Um, one of the... When I ask myself, what does this accomplish? Like, what is Elrond accomplishing by presenting Boromir to Gandalf? I think the primary thing that he is accomplishing is communicating clearly to Boromir that Gandalf is, like, the number two here, right? This is his house. This is Elrond's house. This is Elrond's council, right? He is, uh, he seeks for counsel. So he's come to Elrond looking for counsel. And now he is, um, he's making it clear to Bor. I don't think anybody else in the room needs to have it made clear to them that Gandalf is kind of a big deal at this council, right? That Gandalf is second only to Elrond, uh, at this council. Um, but to Boromir, it would not at all be clear. In fact, given that we know that from what we know or what we're going to know about Boromir's acquaintance with Gandalf down in Minas Tirith, Boromir doesn't think much of him, right? Boromir doesn't have much to do with him. Um, exactly, Tony, that's just exactly it. Whatever Gandalf's status might be in Minas Tirith, um, he's a big deal here, right? Um, exactly. Exactly. Well, it's, well, yeah, so Fort Thomas, he, he, he knows that he's a wizard and he kind of knows that that's a big deal. Um, uh, but, um, but again, he's, um, not treated like a huge deal, uh, in Minas Tirith and certainly doesn't seem to be viewed as worth all that much by Boromir himself. Um, Faramir, yes, Boromir, no. Um, yeah, I can't imagine that Gandalf has been treated in quite that way, was treated in quite that way in Minas Tirith. Um, Matt, exactly. You present the lesser person to the superior person. Um, and I agree, Boromir probably didn't get that sense. Exactly. Um, and it's true, Tony, that he might have felt licensed to be disrespectful to Gandalf otherwise. I doubt that, you know, Elrond is uh, worried that Boromir is going to, you know, you know, bust out and, um, you know, completely, you know, show flagrant disrespect to Gandalf. But again, a, a very clear message is being sent here um, that El Elrond is showing peculiar honor to uh, to Gandalf. And... um it could be, Mike, absolutely, it could be a kindness um, from Elrond to Boromir to give him these kind of cues. Like, I, I want to make sure you understand how things are going down here, right? I want to make sure you understand the decorum of this council, because you might not guess that from what you've seen. Um, I think that that is, I think that that is possible. Um, there's also, it also might be for others' benefit, right? Here's a thing that I think we can sometimes take for granted. I think that we can sometimes take for granted the fact, or the idea, the conception, that all of the wise take Gandalf super seriously. Right. Um, 
we know because we've read the books, right? We know that Gandalf is like, you know, in the end, the, the leader and general of the whole thing, right? He is Sauron's chief foe in Middle Earth. But that's not obvious to everybody. In fact, that's going to come as quite a surprise to many folks. Exactly, JJ. Gandalf smokes and hangs out with hobbits, right? Um, what's he ever done? Gan uh, Elrond trusts him. We know that Elrond and Gandalf have a close relationship. Um, Elrond gets it. Galadriel gets it. The others don't necessarily get it. Does Radagast get it? Um, yeah, Denethor doesn't take Gandalf all that seriously. He doesn't, you know, make him beg on the street or anything. Um, but, uh, and yes, later we'll find out that, that Círdan gets it. But to mo Gandalf is not showy, right? Again, think about the difference between, think about the, the relationship that Saruman has, and I don't mean in recent days, right? Prior to going bad, or prior, at least prior to revealing that he had gone bad, think of the status that Saruman has maintained. Saruman's relationship with Rohan, Saruman's relationship with Gondor, right? Becoming the, uh, you know, taking over at the, at, uh, at, at Orthanc, right? In Isengard. Um, it is a little ironic that the guy known for fireworks isn't showy, JJ. Very true. But it's certainly, it's certainly the case. Gandalf has no place. Even, even Radagast has got a place, right? He's got Ross Gobel, and yeah, he likes to hang out with animals, and that's pretty humble, but, but still, he's like, the animal dude, like, Bjorn knows him, right? He's still famous in his region, and like, within his milieu, right? But who's Gandalf, right? Uh, this wandering wizard, uh, dressed in rags, who doesn't have a tower, and he doesn't have a place, and he just wanders around doing what right um so um so yeah i i think it's it's is it possible that some of the people galdor even aristor may probably aristor is in the you know because he's around but the people outside uh, uh, you know would um would legolas totally get it right um i'm not uh I'm not really sure, right? I'm not, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily assume that everyone, like all of the good guys of Middle Earth are like, oh, Gandalf, like, yeah, he's like a super big, he's one of the chief of the wise, right? He's, uh, we should all totally do everything that Gandalf says. Like, I don't think that's necessarily the case. He, he keeps, he keeps a pretty low profile, generally. Um, so yes, the other ring bearers would definitely get it. Um, Aragorn knows him, right? And is his friend. Um, but, uh, but I can imagine some of the elves present being a little bit surprised. Notice it's not like to Glorfindel that Elrond is introducing, is presenting Boromir here, which, you know, if you're Galdor from the Havens, right? You probably come in and you're thinking, well, obviously, you know, this is Elrond's house. Obviously he's, 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 he's the number one guy here. Gorfindel presumably is the number two guy, right? No, Gandalf is the number two guy, and Elrond is making that pretty clear. Um, yeah, Gandalf has always been a bit of a disturber of the peace, uh, Matt, and he did, uh, help out with the whole Erebor thing, right? Um, but, um, yeah, exactly. And his reputation in Rohan is a good uh, example. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Cecilia, you're right that it's you know like he he will be mourned in, in Lorien, for instance. Um, I'm not saying that the elves don't have any idea who he is at all, right? Um, the Grey Pilgrim, he is called, right? Um, they know that he's a wizard. They know that he does good. They, they, they I mean, he's a good guy. And, um, clearly that, I mean, everybody in, El in, in Rivendell, like everyone in Lorien is going to know that he is trusted by Elrond and by Galadriel. Um, 
what does Galdor know from Cirdan? That's a little bit less clear. You know, how much time has has uh, has Gandalf spent hanging out? at the Havens, you know, since his arrival, you know, we don't really know for sure. Um, but, um, but anyway, so yeah, I mean, they, 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 they know that, but do they know that he is like, what a big deal? He, I'm not sure that the elves who are mourning him in Lorien after his fall know that like the, you know, the chief captain of the opposition of Sauron has just fallen. Right. I'm not sure that they necessarily realize that. Do you see what I mean? Again, like we, that Gandalf is this, the, you know, the central character, like the main important good guy is something that we can kind of take for granted looking at things from a post, you know, from a, a, knowing what happens in the end and how things work out. Um, but remember, it rem- I'm thinking also of when, um, Aragorn is going to explain this to the captains at Gondor, right in the in the the last debate of the Gondorian captains there at the end of Book Five, and he's got to say like, okay, I want to make one thing clear up front: Gandalf's the guy, and we're following him, right? So I'm I'm going to do. I just want everybody to know that I'm going to do whatever Gandalf tells us to do. So we should all listen to him right now, right? Um, now, of course, a lot of them don't know Gandalf at all, and he, of course, plays almost no role in the in the battle, out on the battlefield. So, um, you know, there's a good reason why somebody like, you know, why some, somebody like Imrahil, for instance, might not really uh, get it uh, fully. But, um, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, Good. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, Mike says there has to be a little voice in the back of Gandalf's head saying, oh, no, why did it have to be this one and not his brother? Yeah, I, I've got to think Gandalf is sitting there thinking, hmm, Boromir, huh? Uh, that's a little disappointing, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Exactly, Druid's Fire. Gondor sent the jock, not the nerd. Uh, it does seem so. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, okay. I am tempted to attempt a fourth slide, but I think after a, a question at the beginning and then three slides, um, whew, I'm all... Uh, I'm all tuckered out. So I think we should stop there. Uh, and then we will get, uh, uh, we will get after this next week, we will begin the actual discussion, uh, at the council, which is kind of cool. Um, so thanks everybody, uh, for joining us tonight. So I'm gonna, we're gonna end our, uh, our text discussion here. It's, uh, it's field trip time. Uh, so feel free to join us. You can switch over if you're watching on Twitter. You can switch over to, uh, uh, twitch.tv slash signumu. And uh, we we will uh, uh, we will continue with our field trip, um, but uh, other than that, I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter. Good night there. Okay, and good night to the um, uh, to the folks on the town there as well. Good to have you guys with us again, also. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hey there, Valori. How are you? Doing all right. Doing Excellent. all right. So we heading to Thorns Hall, Thorns Thorns Gate. Gate. This time? Thorns, Thorns Gate, Gate this time. That's absolutely. That sounds. Good. So, just out of curiosity, what do you think elves smell like? Oh, okay. This so has been, this has been plaguing me for the, since the whole time. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. So I think. Um, I think we that we have a passage which describes what I I think is what Bilbo is smelling, um, and I don't remember the exact. Um, it's in the Akalabeth when we're told that they can't, um, like how they can, like if they go if they sail in tall ships as far west as they're allowed to go, uh, they. Um, uh, they can just kind of, they can just barely see Elfin home from a distance. And, mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes when the wind is in the west, 
this smell will be wafted to them in Numenor. Um, and it's like the, um, the, this, and, and we, we get a description of it. It's like the, you know, the scent of flowers and undying meads and, and, and all of that. Um, okay. it's a, it's a, it's a full sentence describing the scent that wafts over, uh, the, the sea to Numenor from Elvenholm. So I'm pretty sure that's what elves, that's what, so, you know, when Bilbo's like, smells like elves, it's just exactly what they would have said, uh, in Numenor basically. Oh, wow. That's so it's got like this whole sentence, like it'd be on the back of an old spice bottle kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. It's uh, it's, it's, it's Look a pretty full description. I'm on a horse. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love yeah. it. See, that's, that's way more complicated than my answer. I was going to be like, it's my smell like pine tree and baby powder. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, you know, the, uh, of course we're not told in the, in the, in, you know, in the Hobbit exactly, um, uh, um uh exactly what um uh it's what well it smells like met. right um you yeah. know it just says yeah. it smells like elves and then doesn't tell us anything else um i guess in context it guess it would smell like baking oat cakes and <laughs> and you know the the river at night and all that kind of thing um tra la 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 <laughs> yeah exactly um but uh, but yes, it does enable us to imagine all of the like most wonderful and enticing smells that we can imagine. Yeah, reminded of that bit from Harry Potter where for the Felis Felicius is supposed to smell like your favorite things in the world. Right, exactly, exactly. Like, yes, just like that. Um, fresh baked cookies and twenty dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cinnamon and barbecue sauce, as Edith Haldora says. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, that yeah, no, that that takes all my boxes. Or bacon. Yes. Bacon. Yes. Or bacon. Ooh, yeah. I don't want the else to smell like bacon. That's just all. That's just wrong. That means they've been out in the sun too long, right? Turn red. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay, I think are we good. Yep. We set think off so. Here? We didn't. Yeah, okay. we didn't have a big crowd this time. All right, so I'm tempted to look around here, but I want to be. I want to pick up where we we're gonna we're gonna ride south first. Okay. Um, because we almost, but didn't quite get all the way up here. Mm -hmm. But we got close enough as. No matter. See some of this gate stuff, from a distance anyway. Yes, exactly. We did get down almost into sight of this, right? This is about, yeah, that, this, that hill straight in front of us is where we wandered off to find that really interesting isolated house. So we were okay. looking for the snowman and found a house. Exactly. Um, so here, oh. Oh, yes. Look at this. I didn't even notice this place. Because there's no door. Um, we can't get into it, right? Well, I, I, gosh, didn't there used to be a stair up here or something? Or am I thinking of some place else? I think else? there's a different one right around the corner. Yeah, I think so. What does the map say this is? Map says nothing. Nothing. It's just a... I guess this is one of those dwarf doors that's not meant to be seen when shut. Yeah, it's quite possible. Or it's a it's a passageway from, from one place to another. Yeah, yeah. But this is definitely very, um, uh, this is definitely, um, long beardish and not yeah. dour handy. It's not as pointy. Yeah. And of course, that's unsurprising in that we are getting to the center of the long beard power. I'm looking at the mm -hmm. thing about there's like a little hutment up on the shoulder of the hill there up above. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna. Th I, I think this has to be some kind of gate. Um, some kind of entrance mm -hmm. into some internal mountain pass here. Maybe it's the servants' entrance or the trade entrance. Yeah, maybe the trade entrance. Yeah, there's like a loading dock in there. Yeah, and then of course we get a we we get a classic um, a classic 
Longbeardian, Longbeardian Palandor. Okay. Long, yeah. Longbeardian uh, arch there. I think this is the one that you were oh, thinking. Oh yeah, of. this is the yeah this is a stairway. This used to have a quest for um, for uh, jeweler. Very early oh, jeweler right. quest on. Yeah. See, this also looks like the door was sort of removed here. But again, dwarf doors are not made to be seen when shut. We're told with some authority, so presumably that applies here too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now this one is a little pointier. Yes. But I'm still... So one of the things I'm looking for is any evidence of dour handy architecture anywhere in this region. Right? I mean, we, we saw it before. So, like, was Sarnur their seat of power? Um, mm-hmm. and, and we've seen, of course, so many places where the dour, the dour hands had built, and then the longbeards came, and it seems almost like on principle, right? Even if they weren't using it for anything, they were like, we're going to build over this. Um, yep. So, I wanted to see if the, you know, this area up here was also, was going to be like that as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, those, those towers over there, those, those ramparts are... Look a little tower handy. Yeah, well, they're fancier, certainly, than any of the long beard stuff that we've seen. They like the pointy up. bits. Yeah. Okay. I was. I, I couldn't tell if there was from a distance. I couldn't tell if there was some kind of symbol or insignia in, in those. Uh, in between those arches there, but it, there's not. It's just a design with frost on it. So. Yeah. It looked more complex from a distance, like it might be a, an image, but it's not. Yeah. It's just pareidolia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That we got our blue lanterns. Yeah, we got the blue lanterns. But no sign of jasper anywhere, red or red or green. We got these funny um, sort of flowery, stamen-y looking minarets up there. What on top of the? Yeah. Yeah, yeah on top of the gate. On top of the gate, and those we've seen. We saw those first, I think, down in Kelador. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and once again, the towers. Everything that we're seeing up here matches the architecture of that wall that was just behind us. And I don't see anything obviously dour handy about the sort of main edifice around the gate there. Nope, me neither. Okay. Then, of course, we have... Don't think I noticed that giant face on the side there. Yeah, I in the mountain. I is that new? Took a long time to notice that. I don't. Rem- I. I. It might not be new. But not yeah, in the Seven Hills. It's yeah. It's um. Uh, hard to not see once you see it because it's even got a, a hand. See his right hand down there. Yeah, I see two hands. One over a domey thing, and one sort of. Re- Look, hold it being held up like the statue in front of us. Yes, yes. Um, wow, that uh, is really cool. I assume I assume we can't get up there, right? I don't know. It'd be kind of interesting to like so. climb on the face, but um, I'm gonna assume. Well, see. The reason I wanted to get up closer to it was to try to see how new it was. Um, yeah. I, um, yeah, oh, and no, people are confirming the face has always been there. Yep. yep. Really? Yep. Wow, I am there. unobservant. Um, my question is, is it Thorin? Like, is that a new sculpture, a, a new, you know, megalithic sculpture? Is that, um... You know, it's like it's, it's look, it's 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 Thorin's Durin, maybe. gate, Thorin's no. gate. There you go. Like the whole thing is right out there. So is that Thorin, or is this an ancient carving? Again, is that like a dower hand up there? Mm-hmm. Um, He's too kind looking. Yeah. Yeah, it's like either it'd be Thorin or it'd be an incarnation of Durin or Durin himself. Right. Right. Or 
of, but it does make me think, you know, yeah, it does make me think Thorn because he'd be keeping watch over his gate. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Well, we've got Freren here. Yeah. Uh, Freren, who was oh shoot, I'm forgetting this. It was the, his brother, right? Thorn's brother. Yeah. Or was it his uncle? Darn it, I'm forgetting Freren's exact relationship to Thorin. Because, of course, he never gets into the stories. He just We just know yeah. him. It was his brother. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Just kin. We only know about him from the genealogy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, fascinating that he... I mean, he leads with Freren, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Freren is like, I mean, like, we're just like, when you ride in, that's what you see, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of trying to frame the shot, right? From the main entrance yeah. uh, in through the uh, path. What you see is Freren right in front of the gate. Um, honestly, that's why I never noticed the head in the mountains, because the statue was always in my focal point. Right, exactly. Um so this is a pretty big statement to make. This is more than just like, ah, yes, my brother who was once killed a long time ago. Like, I still remember my dearly departed brother. Um, I think Freren was killed. I Now, Bricktail's not... Uh, um, I can't remember either whether he was a burned dwarf or whether he was killed by Smaug at Erebor. I think he was... Somebody do the math. Look at the dates, because we, we, we have the death date of Freren in the genealogy at the end of Appendix A. Mm-hmm. If you could do that with Appendix B, we should be able to figure it out. He was killed at, in, uh, at uh, the Battle of the Azanul Bazaar, Kuno. That was my thinking, too. And it would make a certain amount of sense, because that would have been right around the time that is after the Azanul Bazaar, um, uh-huh. Thorin, when Thorin moves up here, right, from, yes. uh, uh, from you know, so he's down in, in Enidwyth first, right? Um, but after, and, you know, as they are, so that's where they end up after they're wandering, right? When they wander away from Erebor, uh, the first place where they find a home is in, Greater the Greater Dunland area, right in Enidwyth, um, and then Thorin moves up here, and I do believe that it's after the battle, yeah, and uh, after his father's departure. It's not Thran's gate, right? Because I don't think Thran lived here. Um, I no. think that you know that Thran had already wandered off and been captured and uh, imprisoned by the necromancer uh, before Thorin moved up here. So, in other words. Freren's death would have been very recent when this place was made. Um, yes, and, and so- as, as a matter of fact, if you do the um, the opening quest for both elves and dwarves, I think you actually see a different statue in this place when it starts out. I had forgotten that. It has been a long time since I've done those. Um There you go, Deathman was just quoting the game lore about the courtyard. Yes, where it emphasizes he was slain in the Battle of Nanduhirion, uh, giving the elvish name, of course, for the Valley of Azanul Bazaar. Um, mm-hmm. There's not a statue of Skorgrim here first, which they replace with the statue of Freren, is there? I think so. I think it was Skorgrim. Because if Skorgrim is here, then that proves it. I mean, that by itself proves it. Um mm-hmm. Okay, no, no, no. Tora Marthen says in the intro, the dower hands have thrown down Freren and replaced him with Skorgrim. Okay, that does make sense. Okay. Okay, so it's originally Freren, and then they're like down with this long beardy stuff and up with Skorgrim and dower handy stuff. Um, That's right, yes. I think we're supposed to understand that the first one takes place. Um, well, I know the dwarf one is, is about the time Bilbo's exhi- ex- exhibition was, but, you know. 
50 some odd years before or something but right. um right okay and yeah so notice Freren is here walking towards us right as we as we are coming in like he's stepping forward with his hand raised his both of his hands open he's got no axe right both hands are open and his hands extended in greeting as his and his foot is stepping towards us right so it's like Freren is walking out to meet us he is the welcoming committee to our Martha absolutely <laughs> um and it's interesting all the other dwarf stuff we've seen there's been great emphasis on the armor they've been wearing and the yes. jewelry they wear and the weapons they're wearing and this one it's less of that and it's much more humble yeah it's it's re it's just his figure right in his hands and his crown i mean the his his crown like helm there is one of the primary one of the most detailed elements um Indeed. of the of the thing you know so he is uh he was never king of the dwarves um i mean he's thorin's no. little brother but um you know he is given this kind of kingly position but yeah the plinth he's on has more detail yes absolutely absolutely um but yeah it is it does seem sort of something more personal in the and like it's 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 about his face and his crown and not about his armor or his axe or anything like that this is not an opportunity for you know a, a sort of a metal smith to show off um well the other stuff had been fairly um sort of representational this one's definitely striving for more realism yes 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 absolutely yeah, you're right. Um, yes, Frere in his arms wide for Thalus. Exactly. <laughs> Shaka when the walls fell. <laughs> yes. Yes, Thorin when the gate was built. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and there's Thorin looking down over him. Right. So Frerin is here to welcome us. But from this angle right here, it's clear that he is the welcoming emissary of Thorin, if that indeed is Thorin, and not some glowering old dower hand remnant uh, lurking up there. <laughs> but I'm going to, again, so far, we've seen no evidence of dower handy anything. Uh, if I see any, then uh, right here any anyway, then I will begin to suspect. But I think that's probably Thorin. Does it say anywhere? Is there any game lore that specifically mentions that colossal statue up next to the gate? No. It's, like I said, I've been in the game eight years and I never noticed it till now. It's interesting that he's uncrowned, though. And plus, it's not a king, but a good man. Or the crown is what's in his hand. It looks like he has a helm in his hand. In his left hand, to the right of the face? Yes. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, if that's what that mass over there is, it's hard to tell with the snow and the distance. Yeah, I can't really tell where that would be in relation to anything. Maybe similar to, like, the dwarf uh, secret society thing that you can get into with reputation? Maybe. Maybe it's under there. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. I kind of want to do the opening quest again, see how many yeah, I know. are still there. Seriously, I've... Uh, it has been a long time since I have done those. Okay. I'm just going to... We're going to... We're going to end soon, one. but we're going to wander over here. So here's another little mini Frerin. Right? Look at that. Yep. Little mini Frerin. Okay, all long, beardy, and stuff from here. With the added industry on here, we got our metal stovepipes. Yeah, the stovepipes coming out are, are an interesting. We've not seen that, but why would we? Mostly what bit. we've seen is, like, mostly ruins and things. Yeah, or or uh, for more agrarian mm -hmm. stuff, not uh, industry. Mm-hmm. It's a bit tacky, I gotta say. I don't like the pipes sticking out. The pipes, yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's like that apartment with personality you see in the listings. Right. Ooh, nice lamps. 
I do like those steps. This is the this is the Thorn Gates housing development, right? Yes, it is. That's where my personal house is, but I uh, um I almost never approach it from the outside. I think the Mythgard house is still there too. It is. It is. What are those silos? Uh, are those towers under construction? It's definitely part of the more industrial parts. You see the smokestacks coming out of the sides there. Yeah. Maybe some sort of smelting st- smelting oven? Coke oven? Yeah. It does look a it does look a lot like the 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 smelting and coke stuff that you see in um Northern England that dates back to the Industrial Revolution. For for smelting steel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Furnaces of some kind, as Devin says. Hang on, I want to. I want to. What, what's up here? I don't remember what's up here. Stuff. Yeah. Or nothing. In, in stuff case, or nothing. Stuff or nothing. Yeah. It, an interesting view of. It's the called building the River across Gate the way. Watch. River Gate Watch, huh? A cliff Ooh, I'm about to up. run off? Uh, just about. Oh, we got a we got a little like a dam here. I don't think we can reach it from here though. Okay, oh it's a gate oh. right, it's a it's a it's a river gate it's a water gate. Mm-hmm. So that would make the housing the Watergate Hotel? Yeah. It would be. <laughs> Just what I was thinking. Um, that's a good name. It's a good thing. It's, <laughs> it's a good thing it's not been used before. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. All that when I, when I keep seeing these towers from a distance and thinking, "Hey, is that tower hand?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. It's really not. It is unusually ornate." For the long beard stuff, but I don't, it doesn't match the patterns I remember seeing in any of the Darian stuff. No, it doesn't. It looks yeah. more similar to, um, like, uh, Noglog and, uh, actually, mm-hmm. the, even the little cottage we saw on the hill had some elements of this. Yes. Yes. But yeah, you could tell they, they spiffied it up for the housing. Okay. Yeah. can't see it well from this angle, but if you go down there, if you look at the gate, it's a very ornate. Yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll end up there looking at the gate. I just wanted to look at the the colossal statue from up here. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so it, it does, it is clear that from here that what we see down below, it, it's meant to be his beard. Right, so we've got the big Thorin head, presumably, and then his beard flowing down the mountain. Dwarves do like to incorporate natural things as beards in their architecture. We'll see right. more of that in Moria. Right, yes. Like the enormous, <laughs> like the enormous <laughs> drooling statues of, of Moria. <laughs> but it's, it is an interesting idea, though, the idea that dwarves being part of nature nature being part of them yes the 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 glow the growing and living rock yeah Mm -hmm. all right let's go over and check out this gate a little more clearly and and just like you know just like a beard it'll grow and change with the seasons that's right that's pretty oh yeah we got a fancy door and statues on either side yeah. Oh, these are new statues. Haven't seen these before. No, we haven't. But again, see, just like you were saying, look at the um, the the face is just like a nose and two eye holes, but the armor, the detail work of the armor and the the hammer, you know, are, yeah. are very, very much the focal point. Look at the, there's more. There's more attention drawn to the belt buckle than to the face of this dwarf. It's almost like a it's like a mannequin that's meant to yeah. sell the armor. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I love these lamps. I want these lamps. They're pretty. Yeah, these are cool lamps. Reminds me of my little salt rock lamp I got on my bedside table. Then we get the 
door. Uh huh. Four yeah, stars. How many stars? One, four. Four stars with four points. Huh. Seven. Seven hill. Seven mountain peaks. Is that eight with the one down there? If you count, I guess it depends on if you count uh, this one as one or two. You know, the little double peak there. That's true. Um, yeah, maybe it is Rome, Bricktails. That's probably it. Um, ah, there it is. Good. Edith found the quest text. Um, uh, there's a quest called The Missing Guard early on, and it uses that as a direction. It says, The arming cave is to the northwest, very near to the great statue of Thorin carved in the mountain. Okay, so it, it's definitely Thorin. Excellent. Good to have that confirmed. Yeah, good. Uh, I... So I always thought... Remember when Gimli says that, like, the you know, when he does, when he speaks his bit that causes Sam to call dwarf language a, a regular jawcracker, right? Mm-hmm. Um... Uh, anyway, when he, you know, he's, of course he's talking about the mountains of Moria. Um, and he says that they have carved their likeness, you know, all over the place and everything. So I have to imagine that this is one of those things that Gimli was talking about. Uh-huh. But these are therefore the likenesses of the mountains of Moria. So I think yeah. we've got... I'm trying to figure out which one is getting short shrift. Right. Yeah. Well, Karathras, well, we know which one is the... Kalebdil yeah. and Fenuithal, right? Like, mm-hmm. there are the three major mountains of Moria, and I'm assuming... So we've got a bunch of other mountains, right? Yeah. Which, it could, because this is the Misty Mountains, right? So there's, there's a bunch of yeah. mountains, and then they... Um, um, the great mountains of Moria stick up. So this tall one on the left is obviously one, and presumably the other taller one that's lower and to the right is the second. Is the third one the one in the back? Maybe. Can't really say. Maybe. Um, Yeah. I mean, of course, it would be depicting the mountains from a particular perspective. Exactly, Bricktail. So the swirly stuff is the is the mist. It's the misty mountains, mm-hmm. right? That's oh, the, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's not water. It's mist. Yeah, it's not. It's like wind and mist blowing through the misty mountains. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So, Deathmen, the stars would presumably be stars which are, in fact, in the mirror mirror. So it would be like the crown of Durin, right? The four stars uh, yep. would be the crown of Durin above the, um, those exactly the same, the, sta- the, you know, the crown of stars which appear in the mirror mirror, presumably so. Um, that makes sense. The interesting, one of the interesting things to me about this is that it's as, you know, like you were saying about the, um, the 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 carving of uh, Frere and it's it's realism rather than like stylized mountains. They could yeah, just I mean, do it, like a three mountain design, else. right? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, so if they're going to do like a stylized version of the mountains of Moria, we could have like you know just the three just mountains triangles. next to each. Yeah, exactly, triangles sort of superimposed in some way to represent and recall the three mountains of Moria. The fact that the third mountain of Moria, which again I'm guessing is this one in the distance behind, is barely uh-huh. visible, that's verisimilitude, right? Like when you see them from this point, and that would make sense also as to why Gimli recognizes them right away. Like he's looking at, up at the, you know, the mountains in the distance and he's like, I know just what that is, right? Because I see that image all the time. Um, uh, because we carve them all over the place, as he says. Um, so again, it's not just like three mountains that are that are placed sort of equally or or symbolically. 
Um, yeah, this is trying to capture a real image. Exactly, exactly. And uh, as Bricktale says, knowing dwarves, this point of view probably shows where a secret door is, very possibly. Uh, and it's funny, Bricktails, as you're, you know, as you were saying that, and I have like the word door superimposed on the mountains, you know, because my <laughs> mouse is over the truck. There it is. It's there's instead of a instead of a hand pointing at the secret door, right? It's just label door with a little placard. There, that's very thoughtful, though uncharacteristically so. Okay. Well, it moves around a bit, so it's not going to do much good. <laughs> Cool. Also, one last thing I wanted to notice here is this, like, rose window business up here in the top, um, which is unusual. We've not seen this kind of design many places in the in, in the long beardy and dis- uh, architecture. No, we have not. It's, what, an eight-pointed star? One. Yes, eight pointed, but uh, not exactly. Not exactly. Um, it's not quite uh, even on all sides. It's only symmetrical when you divide it uh, up and down. Yes, it's got but, verticals. Well, no, it's got. Well, it's got, I guess it is. It's just sort of oblong. It's 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 odd. It's not. Um, um, yeah. It's symmetrical, but it's not divided evenly into. Yes. Yes. The the points of the star are not radial. Yes. Nor are there any that... I mean, and there are no points that stick straight up, straight down, or, you know, straight out on the sides. Um, That's true. It's almost, it looks like it's housing for a gem, but there's, like, no gem in the middle. It does look like that. Um, like we might see a similar kind of design in a smaller, like, pendant or something. Um, or and this is a, done... a glowing lamp or something. Right. And this is done big. Though I wonder, is that a window in the middle? So instead of a gem, there's a, you know, a hole or, or just glass for, for the light to shine through from within? Or to okay, within? A gorgeous one lit from the back, sure. Yeah. It's a bit yeah. like... It's a bit like when you catch at church at the wrong time of day and you're just looking at the black windows going, oh, darn. Right, right, exactly. I think that might be what we're seeing here. Um, it looks a bit like they're keys. You know, they had like sort of like a bulbous bit and then... Right. I mean, what better to put on a house than, you know... <laughs> <laughs> a giant key. Yeah, yeah, possibly so. Possibly so. Well, that's interesting. I'll be interested to see if we see this kind of motif anywhere else. Um, okay, looking at the... Sorry, just looking over at the Thorn statue. Definitely might have to go inside next time, take a look around, see if we can see what that looks like on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Or any windows. Cool. Okay, yeah, and we can see Thorin looking. You can see Thorin from everywhere, even places where you can't see the gate. There's not been anywhere we've gone yet that you can't see it. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting. Okay, cool. All right, well, we should stop there as it's getting late. Um, we'll continue our exploration of Thorin's gate uh, next time. We'll come up through here. Before we go inside and do the main Thorin's gate proper, we'll finish looking uh-huh. around the... Uh, um, the uh, the grounds out here and the different <laughs> areas that we meet in the elf and dwarf intro areas. Um, okay, very good. Well, thanks everybody for joining me this week. We will be back again next week, as I said, uh, for our final Exploring the Lord of the Rings of 2019. Uh, <laughs> so thanks everybody, and I look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Good night now. Good night. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.